Okay, so my name is Josie Fraser. Um, I'm from England. I'm very, very happy to be here. Um, there's very few people from the UK uh, in attendance at this conference, unfortunately. So I'm really glad to be here to talk about some of the work that's going on um, in the country. I'm an educational technologist, um, which means that I work supporting the use of um, teaching and learning through technology. Um, and I've worked in a whole range of roles in different sectors as well. So I've worked a lot with the FE sector, a lot with the university sector. The work that I'm going to talk about today is work that I've been doing with the school sector and specifically with the secondary school sector in England, which is from age 11 to either 16 or 18, because some schools have a little carry-on age as well. So just to um, kind of contextualise that. So I've put a picture of Leicester up because that's where I'm from and that's what I'm talking about. And uh, I'm just taking a guess. Some of you may not know where Leicester is. I know it won't be very many of you in the room, but for those of you who are a bit embarrassed because you don't know where Leicester is, there it is. Um, also, I wanted to kind of have an image because I wanted to... Uh, it's very easy when we talk about digital literacy and digital competencies for us to talk about things that sound really nice but not connect them down to actual what that means and what that looks like. So what I'm going to do later on in this talk is talk about some concrete examples of work that I've done and that teachers have done in the context of the digital literacy work that I'm going to talk about as well. Um, it's a fantastic place. If you haven't been to Leicester, you should all go and visit. The food is amazing. In terms of cities, it's a kind of medium-sized city. Um, we have one of the most culturally and ethnically diverse populations in Europe, um, which means that the food is brilliant. And we are very proud of our diversity and our um, and, and, and how many celebrations we get to have a year as well. In terms of the kind of um, school age population, we have slightly more young people in the city than is the national average. We have the same problem that many, many cities in England have at the moment with a population bulge, which is impacting on the schools in terms of places. There's not enough places for the numbers of young people that are coming through at the moment, um, and people are struggling around that. We also have a higher than average percentage of children living in comparative poverty in the city. So for our city, it's one in every three young people are growing up in comparative poverty. So obviously, the work that I've been doing has been for Leicester City Council. and They're a service provider for the people of Leicester City Council. So supporting and serving the needs of all of the people in Leicester is kind of a priority in terms of the work that I'm doing. So I'm always thinking... Um, in, in, particularly in terms of those more marginalised and more disadvantaged communities and young people and how our work impacts and affects them, not just um, some lucky kids or some um, kids who are look, fortunate enough to have the cultural capital to be able to access things, but actually how do we make sure every single child in the city can access a level of opportunity and equality. And one of the ways that we've done that is through this project, um, which has come about in the uh, context of a huge building programme. So we recently rebuilt 23 secondary and SEN schools across the city. So they're mainstream, large mainstream schools, but also schools for children with special education needs of a wide variety and children with social, emotional and behavioural problems who have been excluded from mainstream education as well. So a really mixed population with around uh, 2,000 staff members in and around 20,000 learners in that cohort. So there are more schools in the city and more teachers who our work's impacted and affected, but our core focus for this project is that cluster of 23. So the work was done in the, pr in the process of the project build, and my job was to be in charge of all of the technology of that programme. And one of the things I wanted to make sure is that we're not putting a huge, huge investment in, in the city into technology for the schools that then isn't actually getting used and being the mo made the most of by the staff that are in their schools. So obviously prioritising um, staff development, as the last speaker um, ably kind of covered, is really, really important in terms of taking that forward. These were the kinds of things that I was tasked with by um, the local authority to um, take forward. And obviously, these are the kinds of things that most 
local and national <laughs> authorities in Europe are actually concerned with at the moment. So we took that forward in terms of digital literacy and a digital literacy programme. And I've already said, yes, I'm very well aware that uh, digital literacy, digital competencies are words that get bandied about quite a lot and don't necessarily have substance or meaning to them. So one of the things that we wanted to do is really kind of tackle well, what does it mean to be a professional working in current times as, as, a, as a teacher supporting young people. So some, I was very interested in some of the questions that came up in the, in the last session about that kind of resistance to adoption and to development. And one of the things that I think is that we actually need to radically rethink what our understanding of an educator is as a professional and what it means to be a professional educator at every level within a society that is so immersed and so embedded and so dependent on digital. <coughs> and, and I think uh, that the, one of the things that we strive to do in this project is not look at technology as any kind of add-on, but actually really look at educational practice and look at, well, what does technology mean in that context? So the broad context is obviously um, you know, something that equips staff and learners to get by on a daily basis. And I think there are many, many definitions of digital literacy. Um, this is the one that I typically use, digital tool knowledge plus critical thinking plus social engagement equals digital literacy. Some of the speakers this morning talked about that social engagement piece, about the kind of missing piece very often that we don't allow the world into the kinds of work that we're doing. What I was interested in and what we kind of how we took this programme forward was by looking at digital literacy very, very, in a, in a situated way. So as a citizen of any kind of city within a digital society, you will have certain basic things that you'll actually now have to be able to do to just get along in life. You will have to be able to fill in forms online. You will have to be able to kind of make tax returns, access things. There's a range of different things that have, are increasingly being digitalised or are digitalised or only available online. So, for example, finding information about when your council puts the bins out or all, all kinds of information. Increasingly, there's a level of information that you need just as a citizen just to get by. So what this project is looking at is, OK, so given that that's the case, what does that mean to different groups of people in different areas? So what does that mean to learners as a group? What would that mean to investment bankers, for example, as a, as a group? And in this project, what we looked at is what would that mean to mainstream an SEN secondary teaching staff? And the key questions we asked in, in terms of the project and the research that was carried out was what does it look like in practice? What are the current strengths and gaps across the workforce? Because it's very easy for us to kind of speculate and say, oh, well, I think it's this, I think people are really good at this, I think they're not good at that. But without an evidence base, it's very difficult to actually address it and move forward on it. And how can we best support staff? So this is what the project um, explored. The project was called DigiLit Leicester, and it was a partnership between Leicester City Council, um, our, one of our local universities, De Montfort University, and the 23 schools. So picking up again um, on the previous speaker about that kind of partnership piece, it is very, very important to try and get buy-in. It's a tricky one when it comes to scale because it's very difficult at scale to get the kinds of buy-in that you can do with a more localised project. But I think there are kinds of, of ways, and ways around that. So the project itself consisted of a couple of things. It consisted of working with staff to develop a model of what their priorities were in terms of digital literacy. It involved surveying those staff to find out where they were in terms of that, that, um, that kind of measures that they'd come up with. And then it involved doing a range of different activities, centrally and locally, um, uh, some supported, some kind of independent, and then a follow-up survey to, to look at and measure any progress and use that to inform the next round of activities. So a really kind of a quite nice project circle, still quite short though and still limited in some ways. I'm not going to go into these now, but I'm just going to give you the headings 
of the areas of the framework. There are many, many digital literacy and digital competency frameworks. I'm not trying to go into competition with any of them with this. Our final framework had six strands. All I would advise anyone doing this kind of work is don't do more than six strands. And if possible, try and keep it down. The less areas that you look at and focus on, the better. And in fact, what some of our schools did to kind of follow up the work personally was they picked one strand for their school to be champion of and to really focus on and take forward. And that helps everybody immensely in terms of how much there actually is that you can do in this area. So finding, evaluating and organising, creating and sharing, obviously two of the areas because that's what staff do every day. Every day they're online, they're finding stuff, they're making stuff, they're sharing stuff. Assessment and feedback is really, really important for our staff. Um, communication, collaboration and participation. That was the area that kind of, obviously the obvious things, but also kind of included things around learner voice as well, and also kind of outreach work with um, student and parent communities. E-safety and online identity, obviously really important because if you are working online, particularly in open environments or in social networks or whatever it is that you're doing, you need to ensure that you are supporting your learners in looking after themselves. And online identity is kind of coupled with that because it's to do with how staff actually support themselves in, on, in, in online spaces and present themselves professionally. Okay. Technology supported professional development was another really, really interesting area. How do we use technology to inform our own practice? How do we connect with other educators to actually find out the best kind of methods that are happening in our subject areas? How do we use it to increase the depth and breadth of our own subject knowledge? And how do we um, use technology to um, just take our own learning in areas not necessarily relevant uh, directly linked to our subject forward. Um, four levels were introduced in terms of the framework. I'm not going to talk about these directly now, but basically to be able to differentiate staff. And this is one of the survey's uh, findings that came out. Um, I've only got five minutes left, so I'm not going to go into huge detail, but the two outlines here are basically the areas where we had the most confidence in the city and the least confidence in the city. E-safety and online had incredibly high levels of safety. That's to do with the kind of statutory and regulatory framework in England and the kind of support that staff get around that area. Communication, collaboration, participation got the lowest scores. Headline findings was 56%, a huge, huge amount, felt really confident in one or more of their areas. And that is really incredible. That's an incredible finding for a, a very mixed population, people teaching different subjects, different kinds of pupils, different ages of pupils within that secondary scope. So that's the brilliant news. The bad news was 23% were entry level. Now our benchmark for what you kind of need to survive in the classroom was the one up at core. So entry meant that you were incredibly unconfident or you'd had very, very little experience in using those te technologies, if any, at all. So that's obviously a massive concern for us. Um, project had a huge range of impacts, but I do want to get onto the projects to um, talk to you about those because of the time. And one of the other things I want to point out is that we did achieve huge things as a city and some great and the, and the projects that came out of the work and the, and the, the staff and the organisational development that was linked to the work was fantastic and something I'm very, very proud of. It's not sustainable, though, because that was linked to a specific project. In England at the moment, there is no kind of um, local or national government uh, technology supported learning agenda for the schools. There's nothing there. There's, there's little bits and pieces around upskilling for teaching coding, for teaching computing, but there's no real focus or drive. And without that, it makes it really, really difficult for enthusiastic teachers, let alone teachers who are scared and struggling to actually maintain momentum and develop. 
So when you empower school staff, when you actually give them a framework that allows them to use technology and to take technology forward in ways that help them and their students, not you, not your agenda, but actually use that kind of digital literacy framework to help them understand how they can use technology in their work practice. These are some of the projects that came over. So the Cyabonga project, this is actually run for a few years now. Um, it's a project between a very disadvantaged school in the city and a very disadvantaged school in South Africa. And they get together once a year and they have a live Skype concert between the two schools. Our, our learners are learning songs in Zulu, their learners are learning songs in English. It's, it's just an incredible event. The, both the communities get to know more about each other. We've got some kids in that city in Leicester who haven't been into the city centre. So this way, they're actually connecting to learners in a different, on a different continent and in a different country. MP6 is a political speaking competition that's also been really successful and gone from strength to strength since we supported it. And this is a competition for 13 to 17-year-olds to get up and tell local politicians what they think. And they talk, they cover every single topic, um, you know, from the very uncontentious, like sugar tax, to um, Islamophobia, the role of feminism in Pakistan, a whole range of issues that you would not expect these young people to, to be passionate and concerned about. Um, but because we provide them with that platform, you actually get to hear their voices and um, they get to hear each other's voices as well. And all of that material is recorded, shared, built upon. This is a project where one of our SEN schools for young people with um, severe and multiple disabilities, so these are life-limiting disabilities, um, who have severe communication problems. The, um, the market products at the moment for augmentative and alternative communication devices are horribly expensive. They're really, really expensive, and they come with bundled specific software that is only available on those brought devices. And they cost a fortune. So what this project did is it took normal tablets. In this case, they used, they used iPads. They worked with a company to actually produce um, software to help learners communicate. So they're doing this for a tenth of the cost of the commercial price. And they actually, during the process of this project, they found out preferences from their young people that they didn't know before. So for example, they found out that one of their students loved this kind of biscuit and didn't like this kind of biscuit. And that's such a small thing, but if you think about it in terms of the quality of life of those young people, it is pretty amazing. I'm nearly finished, I know. So, um, two more quick things. Star eSafety Toolkit. Now, this was three of our SEN schools got together, and they worked with an organisation called Childnet International, who are quite well-known Europe, uh, Europe-wide. And they created an eSafety uh, package of resources and information for staff working with learners on the autistic spectrum, because it didn't exist. All of the e-safety things that we're about were focused on learners without um, learning disabilities and they weren't suitable and they weren't helpful and they weren't, you know, they were either having to use things that were pitched too young or things that weren't effective. So they worked collectively to create effective resources and to build a community around this as well. One of the other projects, this is the project that I'm going to be talking about tomorrow, was our creation of open educational resource guidance for schools. And we picked this up in terms of the kind of project outcomes. It highlighted that we needed to do some work and put some money into this area. And out of that came a um, piece of work that we did with Oxford University and several of our schools, creating um, resources to support school staff in open education resources. And this has gone on to inform the Australian school systems, open education guidance, it's been adopted and adapted by the African Virtual Online University. It's been used by every single sector and built on. So we're really incredibly proud about that. All of our project work has been openly licensed and put back in to the public pot for people to make use of and to take forward. And I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions at all? Oh, a couple over here. Yeah, oh, thank you ever so much. I'm on Twitter probably too much, <laughs> and my Twitter name is at Josie Fraser as well if you are on Twitter.
Thanks, Josie. That was really interesting. Um, you mentioned you worked in different sectors of education, so yeah. I'd just be interested to hear what you know the differences and similarities between, say, working at school sector and higher ed, and whether yeah. you think challenges are the same for teachers, educators, learners. Um, and then briefly, you mentioned also digital literacy and the lack of a kind of national strategy encompassing all strands of digital literacy. Do you think? coding kind of took over too much on the agenda there? I'd be interested just to hear if yeah, you were... Two the massive questions, right. but okay, I will do my last. best. I'll thanks do my best. Me. No, so in terms of differences between sectors, I think there's probably at, at core, in terms of professionalism and in terms of professional development, there are probably more similarities than there are differences. In terms of kind of policy frameworks, limitations, contracts of work, all of those other kinds of things, there are obviously significant differences that, that make it a difference. One of the things that I think I've learned through this project is the field is so wide that it is very, very difficult to be spe specific about things outside of what it is that you're trying to achieve and what area you're trying to achieve. So, for example, one of the strands in there was assessment and feedback. And you can see how that can play out through secondary, through junior, through FE, through HE. And you can see that actually the line of the work that would be going on would have some similarities and would have some differences around there, but you would have the same challenges and probably that particular area would be a priority in each sector as well. So bringing, reining it back is helpful to look at that, I think, in terms of that. Your other question about computing. Um, I'm delighted that we're recognising um, computing. I'm a big fan of technology. It's what I do for my living. You know, I'm, I'm really keen on it. What I'm not so keen on is the kind of lack of support for teaching staff and for schools in terms of that. I think different countries have different experiences of it, but um, from my perspective, what I would, my personal opinion, is that the focus has been on getting learners to do certain things and changing curriculums, great, creating great curriculums, but actually not properly supporting staff and supporting schools to deliver those, um, which is, is going to not lead to a great end result at all. And, you know, it's a huge opportunity to change the curriculum that much and to say, you know what, we're going to put these things that are really relevant to your current life, to your future job prospects, that will give you loads of opportunities. It's a big thing to have change the curriculum and have those. And it seems to me like a tremendous waste to not properly and thoroughly resource those and support them. So any, any more questions? You had the sentence, uh, what does li li digital literacy look like in practice? Yeah. So for start, uh, uh, when we say our teachers, uh, our pupils are digital natives, yeah. what does it really mean? Are they the really digital natives and how much you can enhance the digital skills uh, okay. with, uh, with this program? So I would say no, there's no such thing as digital natives at all. It's a horrible term that's fallen out of, that's, that's been perpetuated by marketing segmentization of the younger population. And actually, um, if you look at a lot of kind of skills profiles, you, don't you can't necessarily segregate people by skills in that same way anymore. Um, I also think it's kind of, uh, those kind of assumptions work to, they over, they mean that young people get under-supported and that older people get dismissed. So it, there's, there's a lot of bad things in those kinds of terms and those kinds of approaches. When you look at young people, yes, they're very confident about technology. Yes, they can do certain things. They don't always know how the things that they can do work. And if you look specifically at things like critical engagement with texts, um, analysis of facts and truth and things like that, you know, they're not, they're not brilliant. Some of them have good strategies, a lot of them have no strategies, you know, and if you look at, I think, the, um, one of the research papers that I read recently that looked at the reasons that young people gave for trusting sites, a small percentage, but it was still a percentage, said things like, it does, it, because the web page looks good, you know, it's, it's, it's a tip if you want to get false information out there, make your site look really nice, but not useful for young people. So there's a huge role for educators still to play in supporting those kind of critical skills and engagement with technologies. And I, I 
avoid at all costs using the word digital natives. For young people, it's basically ubiquitous. All of this, like the web and all of that, it's yeah. just a part of them. They don't question it as we do. For them, it's like an axiom. I, I, every time I have a financial debate with someone, I don't question the axiom one plus one is two. See what I mean? I, I, yeah. So they don't question the web or learning through the, through the web or the internet yeah. per se. It's just a ground zero for them. Yeah, and they, they've not known anything else. But what I'd, what I'd say is we've actually gone beyond that tipping point now. So 10 years ago, my career consisted mainly of telling people, the internet is coming, we need to do something about it. And now, a lot of my time is spent saying, the internet is here, we didn't do anything about all of these things, so we didn't think about the implications of these things. What are we going to do about it now? I think the, the technology has become mainstream. You watch the news, at least two stories on the news nearly every time is something to do with online technologies or websites or something. It's, it's become ubiquitous for everybody, I would argue now. Obviously, there are a small percentage of people for whom, um, who are disadvantaged or disengaged, who aren't in that same place. But actually, in terms of mainstreaming, we've, we've gone beyond that tipping point now for reliance and dependence and use of technologies in, the, in our everyday lives. 